with recurrent UTIs are most likely having a biofilm infection that periodically surfaces. Mm -hmm. It's not a reinfection. We're in touch with thousands of people and recurrent and chronic UTI sufferers are constantly told things like wipe from front to back, which is pretty basic information once you get to that point. And there has to be more that we can do in order to prevent future UTIs and help the bladder heal. So maybe you can share some, some of your thoughts on that. Certainly. Um, there is more to it than wiping <laughs> front to back. <laughs> um, the, let's go back to how infections start anyway. Okay, infection equals number of organisms times virulence of organism divided by resistance of host. So when they say wipe front to back, they're trying to reduce the number of organisms that um, can find their way into the urethra and ascend. Mm -hmm. um, we've all been told as women that we have very short urethras and so somehow by this bad design process, um, we are just always going to get UTIs and just go learn to live with it. Um, <laughs> but there are some things that can be done that would help prevent bacteria from ascending the urethra and getting into the bladder itself. Um, first of all, let's think a little bit about anatomy. Mm -hmm. um, people who are constipated have a megacolon. It gets overstretched and it puts pressure on the bladder neck. And that pressure prevents you from completely emptying your bladder. And um, therefore, the too much urine sits there and propagates the growth of the bacteria. So not getting constipated is a very first basic step. Mm -hmm. You want your bladder to be able to empty completely. Um, the next thing is it takes about three hours for bacteria to colonize the urethra. And once it colonizes the urethra, it can easily get into the bladder itself. And the place where the bladder joins to the urethra is kind of funnel shape um, or a triangle. Mm -hmm. And therefore, many of us initially were told we had urethritis because we had inflammation and irritation of the urethra. Mm -hmm. Then we were told we had trigonitis because that trigone area was inflamed. Mm -hmm. And then we were diagnosed with interstitial cystitis because the inflammation had now spread to the bladder wall. And, and so based on the anatomy of where the infection had slowly but steadily spread, we got different diagnoses. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep the urethra from colonizing? Well, first of all, if it takes three hours for the bacteria to colonize, we should be emptying our bladders during waking hours at least every three hours. Mm -hmm. Just very basic. And you should be drinking enough fluids every day that you feel like you do need to empty your bladder at least every three hours. And if you don't have that, then you're not drinking enough fluid. And I know if you drink less, you have to urinate less frequently, and therefore you might have less pain if urinating yeah. triggers pain at the end of urination or during urination. Mm -hmm. And so you tend to avoid it. So that's kind of a bad idea, just from the standpoint that if you don't void frequently enough, you are more likely to have more bacteria colonizing and therefore getting into the bladder. Um, we have the opposite problem of people drinking too much. Mm -hmm. This is seldom discussed. Um, we're told if you have a urinary tract infection, you should drink, 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 and yeah. flush the infection out of your system. Now, that may work as an initial step for some people. But if you're on an antibiotic, it is possible to over dilute the urine. Mm -hmm. And once again, you're only getting a sub therapeutic dose of the antibiotic and it's not gonna work as well. So, 
So there needs to be a, a balance there. Um, you know, we say avoid drinking sufficiently that you need to avoid every two to three hours is helpful. Um, let's talk about intercourse. There are some positions in which the urethra can be more irritated and you and your partner need to find positions that minimize some of that, that um, mechanical inflammation, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the, simply both partners washing up well before, drinking a lot of fluid before, urinating before, urinating afterwards, is gonna also help prevent any ascending bacteria from getting into the bladder. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about probiotics. Um, probiotics are the good guys. They normally live in your gut. They're an important part of the immune system. Um, they actually produce a small amount of hydrogen peroxide in their life cycle, which helps, has an antiviral and an antibacterial effect. Um, they're the most important source of your vitamin K that is needed to make some of the um, TAT complexes that break down extra fibrin. So having enough probiotics in your GI tract can actually help you break down the biofilms. Mm -hmm. um, so the probiotics are really important. Now, we also know that they help prevent urinary tract infections. There was a study done, oh gosh, way back in the early 1980s in which they had a group of postmenopausal chronic UTI women douching with probiotics once a week. Messy, mm -hmm. messy. But there was a 76% reduction of chronic UTIs in that population. Well, to my knowledge, nobody ever followed up on that study, and, um, but it's always stuck in my head. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand how it worked until recently. I watched a webinar um, put on by Pathnostics Lab in which Dr. Alan Wolf, who was instrumental with the Urinary Biome Project, mm -hmm. shared some of the findings. And it turns out that some of the probiotics, uh, such as Lactobacillus crispatus, was found in a higher percentage of women without any urinary symptoms. And Lactobacillus gasseri was found in a higher population of women with overactive bladders. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't have any data on chronic UTIs. They didn't have any data on interstitial cystitis. But I will tell you that when he showed what bacteria they did find in small percentages, it was totally different than what I'm finding in my chronic UTI and um, I see population. So just because 7% of the women had enterococcus in their urine doesn't mean that if your test comes back with enterococcus, which is the most prevalent organism that both Dr. Fugazato found with his broth cultures and I'm finding with DNA testing, mm -hmm. just because it comes back with enterococcus doesn't mean that this is a normal urinary pathogen right. <laughs> to be found. So we have to be careful how some of that data gets interpreted. Um, not only that, but when I treat and eradicate that pathogen, the bladder symptoms go away okay. and resolve, as long as we don't have other pathogens there mm -hmm. as well. So you have to be careful how you use some of that urinary biome data, but it does inform us that some of these healthy bacteria probably have a role in preventing some of the other pathogens from colonizing the bladder. Mm -hmm. um, you see this in the nasal passage. So, there are a number of bacteria that are normal and healthy there and actually prevent people from getting MRSA or prevent them from getting the flu or prevent them from getting other known infections that are circulating. And those bacteria are healthy and appropriate. So when you take a probiotic, either orally or vaginally, um, 
those should help protect the urinary tract from ascending infections. Do you think one works better than the other, the oral or the vaginal suppository probiotic? They kind of all find their way to the right place eventually. Okay. Um, I will say that because so many patients have been on so many oral antibiotics and have dis disrupted their vaginal um, mm -hmm. environment, um, that is a helpful test to do along with the urine. Mm -hmm. Microgen does the vaginal testing, pathnostics does not. And um, by testing the vaginal environment, you can see if you're seeding bad bacteria into the bladder on an ongoing basis. I've had many patients that until we addressed the dysbiosis or the, the, the bad balance of bacteria in the mm -hmm. vaginal tract, we were not able to stop the urinary tract infections. Um, this is particularly true of postmenopausal women mm -hmm. because that vaginal tissue that should be moist and have healthy little hills and valleys called rugae where the good guys like to hang out. Due to the lack of estrogen, those tissues become thin and dry and don't support good bacterial uh, growth. And instead they support the growth of, of pathogens. And mm -hmm. so sometimes some vaginal estrogen will restore that healthy environment. So the healthy bacteria, the lactobacillus and bifidus can colonize and um, therefore continue to protect the urinary tract. Okay, that kind of leads us into the question of how to break the cycle of recurrent UTI. So you've mentioned balancing an imbalanced vaginal microbiome. Are there other ways that we can try to break the cycle or to prevent the next UTI? I think this is a good chance to dispel a myth. Mm -hmm. that someone with a recurrent UTI is getting reinfected each time. Mm -hmm. Um, the most likely scenario is that you have a biofilm problem, that the bacteria have never been fully eradicated, and that periodically, like any biofilm, when it reaches a certain size, pieces of it um, break off to, to go form a new colony somewhere else mm -hmm. and are free-floating in the urine, or your own thrombin antithrombin complexes have been successful in breaking down a piece of the biofilm, or you're taking a biofilm disruptor. Um, certain things like xylitol, which is a natural sweetener, is known to have good biofilm disruption properties. Mm -hmm. um, so there are things just through the normal life cycle of the bacteria, um, they, they will shed. Anyway, um, so people with recurrent UTIs are most likely having a biofilm infection that periodically surfaces. Mm -hmm. It's not a reinfection. So taking a biofilm disruptor, and hopefully you can get the testing to tell you which one is the best one for you based on your genetics. Mm -hmm. um, and breaking down the biofilm so that the infections found can be adequately treated and the bladder wall can heal so you don't have an environment that fosters the continuation of, of these biofilm communities mm -hmm. um, will ultimately prevent recurrent UTIs and getting the sexual partner chested also could be a part of this. Um, I will say that about 50% of my patients tell me that they flare after intercourse. Mm -hmm. And of those 50%, when we check the sexual partner and we check the male's semen, not the urine, mm -hmm. um, are coming back with the same infections that, that the female I see or recurrent UTI patient has, mm -hmm. whether they are symptomatic or not. Yep. Um, many men have a low-grade chronic prostatitis. They may not have any symptoms, but 
for the sake of the one they love, <laughs> they will get treated. And for some women, that is the way to break that cycle. Are there certain things to look for to know when you should think about testing your partner? Probably the biggest sign is that you flare after intercourse. If you have symptoms within the first couple hours, it's mm -hmm. probably just the mechanics okay. and, and the physical contact. If you have a significant flare 24 to 48 hours afterwards, um, that most certainly is reinfection. Okay, that's good to know. When it comes to healing the bladder, are there things that we can actually actively do to help it rebuild? Or is it more a matter of eradicating the infection? The body's gonna repair itself. Um, that's a given. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanna sidetrack just a tiny bit. Mm -hmm because I think this is a good time to talk about some of the other factors that are ongoing irritants mm -hmm. that may prevent some of this repair taking place. Yeah. Um, the biggest one that I'm finding is mold toxins. Mm -hmm. Mold toxins are not the same as finding fungal infections in the urine itself. These are su chemical substances put out by mold that a person environmentally has been subjected to. It could have been years ago, it could be their current work or housing situation. Mm -hmm. They may not have even realized that they were being subjected because sometimes these mold toxins are behind a wall where there's been a leak in a pipe mm -hmm. or in a roof that leaked. Um, and these molds are still in places that are not visible but that you're still, they're still producing toxins that get into the environment. Mold toxins depress the immune system. They are huge bladder irritants. And I'm finding them about 10% of the time, pretty significant number of my patients, particularly those where we've cleared up the infections and um, that doesn't seem to be a player anymore, but they're still experiencing urinary tract symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, mold toxins also get into the nerves. So sometimes when people have um, other symptoms like the vulvodynia or their symptoms don't tend to wax and wane like they would um, with the bladder wall infection, mm -hmm. but the nerves going to the bladder are inflamed. Their symptoms tend to be more consistent 24 seven. They're not diet dependent. And no matter what they do, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Mm -hmm. um, those are people that I would very much suspect could have a mold toxin issue. Okay. And there's a way of detoxing those uh, mold toxins. It takes six months, nine months usually, um, occasionally as long as a year, but people are noticing great improvements in their urinary symptoms just when they start, just from dealing with the mold to begin with. Um, the other thing that can cause some of the chronic symptoms um, that need to be thought about are tick-borne infections. Mm -hmm. Once again, 10, 15% of my patients whether they can remember ever getting a tick bite or not, I am finding Lyme and some of the other infections that ticks carry, particular Babesia, mm -hmm. um, as getting into the bladder wall. And we did have some patients with bladder biopsy specimens, two different labs tested them for the tick-borne infections and all three came back positive for Lyme and two of the three came back with Babesia, okay. identified with DNA testing as being in the bladder wall. Right. That will continue to cause bladder destruction. The DNA testing won't find it because it, the tick-borne infections stay embedded in mm -hmm. the bladder wall and don't spill out into the urine. Okay. So sometimes being able to address some of the other reasons as to why the bladder wall is not happy and that the nerves have become infected with either tick-borne infections or... Um, have mold toxins mm -hmm. um, can can resolve some of the things that seem to linger on um, okay. symptom right. wise for some people. Yeah. Well, Not that, everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that also leads us to another question on other possible irritants. So things like bath bombs or washes or diet, coffee, alcohol. What are your thoughts on those? 
Oh, <laughs> absolutely. If it bothers your bladder, don't do it. <laughs> um, there is things that um, are known irritants. I mean, I remember um, when I worked pediatrics, um, mm -hmm. little girls in bubble baths were mm -hmm. not good friends. <laughs> And yeah. so anything that's going to add to that, um, hot tubs are particularly nasty. <laughs> yeah. um, and a lot of people picking up infections from hot tubs, I, mm -hmm. I don't trust them. Um, so anything that's going to add to the infectious load or chemical irritation, mm -hmm. um, some of the, the fresheners and washes you have to be very careful of, they alter the pH, they destroy some of the normal skin bacteria that should should be there um, your genital area is not sterile and there are healthy bacteria that right. should be there when someone gets diagnosed with interstitial cystitis they are handed a sheet of paper called an ic diet mm -hmm. um, i have to give dr larian gillespie credit for listening to her patients and believing them that there were certain foods that made their symptoms worse. Mm -hmm. I remember presenting it to my doctor and he said, oh, I don't, I believe people should eat anything they want and you shouldn't be restricted by a diet. Mm -hmm. and, and my thought was, if it keeps me out of pain, I will never eat one of these foods again. <laughs> and so some people are more diet sensitive than others. Mm -hmm. Some people say that the big irritants like alcohol and caffeine bother them, but other foods don't. Other people, one grape, and they can be up all yeah. night long. Um, I was one of those. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, yeah, it took me a while before I could eat a grape again <laughs> right. without panicking that it was going to send me off the edge. But I, I, um, I think it's a symptom management tool. Mm -hmm. There's nothing magic about it. It's not going to fix the problem. If you eat something that's on that diet and your bladder complains about it, you have bought yourself another day or two of misery, but it's not like you've set back your progress by months at a time and the world is going to come to an end. Well, that's good to know. Um, and I think you also need to try various things to see what is your problem or not. I had things on the IC diet that gave my bladder no problem at all. And I had other foods that were not on the diet that would send me off the planet mm -hmm. with pain and, and urgency and frequency. And I would be up most of the night and get out the ice packs and any other yeah. tools I had in my arsenal to manage the, the flare. So um, I just simply took a piece of paper, put it on the refrigerator, drew a line down the middle with a smiley face on one side and a frowning face on the other. And as I discovered which foods I could and couldn't have, I developed my own list. Mm -hmm. And so if you are diet sensitive, you might wanna do that and you might be surprised. Um, there would be foods that you've been avoiding that you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And you might also discover some foods that, that maybe you should be eating because your bladder thinks it's a bad idea. Do you have patients that have been able to go back to eating whatever they want after treating the infection? Absolutely. Everybody. Matter of fact, that's one of the early signs. Mm -hmm. um, people, when they start treating the infections, depending upon how much is there and how much damage to the bladder wall, start noticing some very small but definitive progress. Mm -hmm. um, I will talk to them and they'll say, well, I used to get up four times a night and now I only get up once or twice. Mm -hmm. They might say, um, I didn't used to be able to eat this food, but now I can tolerate small amounts. Um, I'm going a little bit longer between my flares and when they do happen, they aren't as bad as they used to be and they don't last as long. Mm -hmm. So all of those are encouraging signs that you're on the right track. Okay. And it's not gonna be a straight line progress. It's a little dance, two steps forward, one step back, occasionally one step forward and two steps back. But if you take the long view that if you look at where you are now and you look at where you were three months ago or six months ago or a year ago, um, it's very rare for people not to be able to see progress. And whether or not you believe that interstitial cystitis um, is an infection or not, 
um, your body cannot appreciate the infections being there. So if you find infection, there is no compelling reason to not treat it. Mm -hmm. The setbacks can be one of the things that makes it so hard to keep going with treatment. And most people do tend to experience that from what we've heard. But in your opinion, how long does treatment take on average? Oh, goodness. Everybody's different. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I can start working with a patient within the first couple of months, usually we can turn it around in a couple of months. Okay. If it's been a couple of years, it's probably going to take longer. And this is really important. If someone has mold or tick-borne infections, it'll take longer. Mm -hmm. If somebody has one of those genetic hypercoagulation mutations um, in which they don't break down biofilms as well as other people, and those include Leiden factor five, mm -hmm. PI1, PAI hyphen one, which stands mm -hmm. for plasminogen activator inhibitor one, which is the one I find most commonly, by the way. Okay. Um, or lipoprotein A, which is a form of bad LDL cholesterol that isn't generally tested for on a lipid panel. Mm -hmm. um, then we're talking about um, a longer course because we have more biofilms to break down. And um, they generally have more infection. Okay. Makes sense. So the longer you've been suffering, the longer treatment might take in general. In general, yeah. It, but it also depends on how fast we can move. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, so people who are able to do bladder installations with the biofilm disruptor directly in the bladder tend to move faster than people who, who can't and are mm -hmm. depending upon the oral course. Um, people who are following the, the test, retreat, I mean, test, treat, retest, retreat, um, make faster progress than people who maybe feel good after they've treated, don't retest, allow the remaining infections to wall back off in the biofilm, go back to square one where their symptoms are really bad before they retest, mm -hmm. and then retreat. Okay. Um, so if you, if you get the bugs on the run, you get the biofilms broken down, and you keep hitting it, with the infections that are there, of course you're gonna make faster progress and you can get through it sooner than if you only test based on when your symptoms have returned a month or two later. Okay. And are so bad that you say, oh, I guess I better retest. <laughs> it's a compelling reason to retest, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and I know that it's hard to get your mind around that I should test when I'm not having symptoms, but, but that also will be helpful, especially if you take a biofilm disruptor, if you're not staying on one because of your genetics, mm -hmm. take a biofilm disruptor for, for, a couple, for a week, a couple of days before you retest and see what else you can chase out of that biofilm to be found and treated. If someone has recovered from a recurrent or chronic UTI and then years later they experience another UTI, what steps should they take then? Treat it as if you would treat an acute UTI unless you have the genetics that make you prone to making really extravagant biofilms. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think if you have those genetics, you need to stay on a biofilm disruptor um, the rest of your life because that's going to prevent any infection you get, whether it's urinary or anywhere else in your body from walling off in a biofilm. Mm -hmm. The second compelling reason is that if you are making extra fibrin in response to inflammation, and we all get it from lots of sources on an ongoing basis, um, that extra fibrin will be deposited in your um, blood vessels, particularly the arteries, Mm -hmm. and start narrowing them and set you up in the long term for cardiovascular disease. And um, most of you who have those genetics 
have family members, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles who have cardiovascular disease. And so that's one indication that you might be prone to having one of those genetic issues. Mm -hmm. And to take um, a biofilm disruptor geared to which genetics are involved, because they aren't all the same, um, will prevent you from getting another chronic infection as well as um, reduce your risk in the long term of cardiovascular disease.